Okay. So, good luck. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> I would like, uh, first of all, to thank uh, Professor Dragan for giving me the opportunity to be with you, even under those uh, difficult circumstances. And I will uh, share my screen. Oh, I'm going to turn volume off. I... Is it now? No, we cannot see your share screen. Why? Uh... Well, I think you may need to be made host. Open secret, okay. Is that something? I will... Try to make you co-host if I can. So more. So now you can try now, yes. There we okay. go. Super. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. Here we are. <laughs> uh, social media have democratized to a certain degree the production, circulation, and consumption of science. Their users have the opportunity to produce verbal, visual, or multimodal signs providing clues about the way they respond to reality in all its aspects, mundane, ideological, political, partisan, or integrated into hegemonic discourses. Such an opportunity allows semiotics to turn attention to such mechanism of sign and meaning production in search for achieving insight into their structuring, into sign system organizing public discourse. What is more, it allows to proceed into understanding patterns in communication and conflict beyond the pronouns and the public in the semi-public spaces of social platforms. Such an understanding may be used for manipulating publics, as was the case of using social media to assert votes during presidential elections. Such allegations of unlawful campaigning have been made for the Brexit referendum in 2016, as well as for the presidential elections in the US of the same year. Thus, the political importance of understanding such dynamics in production and use of science in cyberspace may be crucial for safeguarding democracy as well. For more than a decade, contrary to bureaucratic efforts for an image of tightly woven, progressive, inclusive, democratic you, a looming crisis has been bringing to the fore the several dress forms of such optimistic ideas. We can single out at least three general trends in the European project crisis. An economic crisis which fell upon the less developed economies of the South plus Ireland. Even the name used to indicate these countries, pigs, is a signifier of a deep crisis in the alleged ideals of you like solidarity. On the contrary, this signifier points to a divide between the Northern, mostly Protestant, and the Southern, Roman Catholic, and Greek Orthodox countries with the relevant cultural values. It is also a sign of the sudden power attributed to stereotypes going back to conflicts, wars and divides between European countries and people. An immigration crisis which gave the rise to far right, fundamentalistic, xenophobic and nationalistic parties and government throughout you deepened the dividing lines of the economic crisis, setting up the framework for further devolution 
of the European construct. Brexit crisis, which has shown that devolution is not only possible, but maybe even desirable by some states and people. It is the last case that we found challenging for the reasons about the semiotics of political communication in social media. At 11 p.m. on 31st January 2020, the UK left the EU and entered the transition period. Actually, the discourses about Brexit have built since 2016 a series of divergent sign systems, both in the UK and EU, as well as throughout the world. These sign systems are the core elements of narrative and conceptualizations about nation and Europe as signs. But I will focus on tweets collected that last eve before Brexit. As part of an ongoing project about the dynamics of Brexit on Twitter, I collected tweets gathered every time the predicted the Brexit date was approaching and every time Brexit was postponed. Some similar collections of tweets data sets are also available online. I used the open source software Gephi to collect the data under the provisions of Twitter API and several open source software programs to analyze the data. At the end, I came across a network with over 19.5 thousand users, 24.5 thousand tweets and retweets, as well as 3,674 hashtags. As the voices in social media multiply exponentially, and since new addictions of posts and comments may introduce communicational noise, though inflation of uniform signs, we have to look for signs of another order, able to elevate above noise and allowing for the meaning to take form. The utilization of digital methods combined with natural language processing offers some solutions like word count, co-occurrences, issue mapping, or topic modeling. Such methods, though, are suitable for linguistic analysis of social media posts. A semiotic analysis may utilize signifiers of a higher order proposed by the users themselves, hashtags. Hashtags are multifunctional signifiers since they relate each individual post to the wider dialogue about the topic and the specific issues of point or points of view. They relate to each other since the users may use more than one hashtag, thus creating certain chains of signifiers. They allow for the condensation of complex meanings. Implementing social network analysis, we achieve a clustering of people and communicative acts with similar meanings. These are indicated in this graph by the use of colors. We anticipate that people with similar ideas will cluster together because of a network feature called homophily. People within each cluster share ideas and exchange mentions with each other while communication will, with the rest of the network is less meaningful. We also anticipate that tweets and hashtags used within such a cluster will shed light to aspects of those ideas. Brexit has provided to be a route available for redesign and eventually for expressing radically different ideas and stances. We were able to locate 132 variants or composites of Brexit among the hashtags used within our corpus. Some have been illuminating of the sentimental tone meant by the user, like Brexit disaster, Brexit isn't working, Brexit shame, or Brexit shed, while, while others may be more neutral and therefore ambivalent. 
There are several ways to lay out such a semantic forest in meaningful ways in search of keys to open understanding. One is to look for the most mentioned hashtags. Three of them are central, namely Brexit, Brexitive, and Brexit Day. Let us have a look at their semantic content. The most important, the most mentioned hashtag in the biggest cluster. The blue one at the bottom is Brexitive. The members of this cluster describe themselves mostly based upon their job or their educational status. Sometimes they express their support to liberals. Among them, there are a few Brexiteers who proudly announce their support to Brexit acting as trolls. They mention a lot David Snyder, actor, writing, and comedian. Dr. Jennifer Cassidy, a former diplomat and politics lecturer, as well as a parody account mimicking Boris Johnson with a self-description that reads, leaving proof that anyone with an Eton education, a few million pounds, and the talent for lying can become prime minister of this great nation parody. The hashtag Brexit is surrounded with a number of Brexit-related hashtags like UnBrexit, Brexit is a crime scene, Brexit disaster, or other less polite ones. Some more ask for freedom, democracy, or British Independence Day. Most of the tweets in this cluster oppose to Brexit, and this is mirrored upon the meaning of Brexit Eve as a sinister Christmas Eve. Such an explanation is supported by the fact that the most common nouns in the tweet corpus of these clusters are Santa, Christmas, and the chimney. An exemplar tweet with the same meaning is Brexit Eve. It's just like Christmas Eve, really. If instead of leaving meats, pies, and sherry for Santa, you set fire to his reindeer. Despite the feeling of a sinister outcome, the sentiment of the tweets was computed as quite positive with a score of 2.54, with more than 40% flagged as positive against less than 3% flagged as negative. The next cluster, the orange one, is a really multinational and multilingual one, actually 40 8.5% of the tweets are written in, the, in a language other than English, mostly in French, 20.7%, Spanish, 8.3%, Italian, 4.8%, or German, 3.5%. Since Brexit is actually generic, it accommodates diverging opinions, either pro or against Brexit. A German user, for example, applauds Brexit as a victory against corporate capitalism. Next Friday will be a great day for Great Britain. Brexit is the victory of, the, of common, ordinary British people against multinational corporation and other EU elites. And the French user finds a solution to shutting down the connection between UK and Europe. One of the problems with Brexit is its connection with Europe. Suddenly, we will have to cut the tunnel under the English Channel. The simplest solution, open a hole and flood the tunnel. But then, on which side should we open the hole? An often mentioned Lithuanian user living in the UK tweeted about racism and xenophobia being overtly expressed by British citizens. One day before Brexit, God shouted at by a male stranger in the street while talking to my toddler in Lithuanian, asking to thank him and go back to my country. The shit show has started and no one knows how bad it will get. Thus mixed are the voices expressed under the hashtag and so it is its meaning. 
the most mentioned user is therefore a mentioned Lithuanian postdoctoral researcher at Leeds University, followed by the vice president of the French far right party of Rassemblement National. The sentimental tone of the tweets was computed as rather neutral with a score of 0.4. 22% of the tweets were flagged as positive and 19.5% as negative. Finally, there is the pink cluster, dominated by Brexit Day, the most talkative among its members, describe their pro-Brexit and that everything else stands in their self-description. They mention that they don't follow any party or even being at the party. They don't mention some users a lot. The sentiment of the tweets was computed as rather positive with a score of 0.94 and almost 20% of the tweets flagged as positive against 3.5% flagged as negative. The most creative among the hashtags beyond Brexit Day used in these clusters tweets is Brexit Massive. The pro-Brexit voices are loud in this cluster. They express pride relating Brexit Day to Independence Day, the name of a sci-fi movie. Happy Independence Day. There is a forgotten nay, almost forbidden word, which means more to me than any other. That word is England. Happy Independence Day. And the Europeanism. Brexit Day by crumbling you, you have been talking the peace out of last three years. We are living at last 31st January. We will do fantastic in the years to come. While in this context, the word Eve is used once again, this time is a positive connotation. Brex Massive can't believe it's nearly here. After all the waiting, what I voted, what I voted for, all those years ago is finally happening, Brexit. There are quite a few differences with the image that we found analyzing the tweets about Brexit nine months earlier. Back then, non-British tweets formed a significantly smaller part of the corpus. There were two pro-Brexit groups calling traitors and liar liars, the members of the parliament and the cabinet while the remainers were still organizing rallies to reverse the result of the referendum. As a conclusion, we could suggest that hashtags are an important semiotic device since they condense the meaning and sentimental polarity of much that is meant in the tweets themselves. They contribute to understanding the dynamics in political communication, follow the fluidity of stances in public opinion, produce snapshots capturing the moment during crucial events or episodes during the unfolding of political action. They are signs of a major importance as they may be taken as representing whole categories of factors, actions and motivations, as representing in an abstract way, what could be taught using thousands of words. Thank you very much. Well. That was a wonderful talk. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I guess we need to go to our next speaker, which according to the schedule is Gabriela. But I'm wondering if Gabriela's, is she still here? I think maybe her internet was having difficulty or something because she doesn't seem to be here. Yes, uh, perhaps is, she has a problem because I don't know, is it here? My um, my internet is cutting in and out as well, so I really hope that it doesn't cut me off while I'm speaking. Um, 
do do we have Roxandra here already? I don't see Roxandra either. Hmm. Let's give um, Gabriela a couple more minutes, maybe maybe two more minutes, and then if if she doesn't reappear, I'll start, and then Gabriela can go after me. Okay. Or or Roxandra, whoever appears first. That's a shame. That's that's the disadvantage of doing this um, virtually. Is uh, technology has to cooperate. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> that Unfortunately. <laughs> I find it found it really interesting. Um, um, Sophia, the, the my my ancestral heritage on my father's side is Lithuanian and a lot of my family members who still live in Lithuania have sensed the same thing either yeah. when traveling to England or speaking to family who live in England. So yeah, it's it'd be interesting to do um, another study specifically narrowing into, um, you know, um, racist ideologies that really fueled, like how, how closely was that related to Brexit? Yes. Yeah. yeah. But I don't know how without that, how to approach that, that kind of a study. Um, uh, yeah. Well, we do uh, data mining and uh, we do data mining in real time. Yeah. So uh, I gather all the tweets and uh, we try to analyze them. Yeah. Had, had you considered to visualize them? If you see the visualizations, these are the networks that uh, can, um, uh, can be. I wonder if there's a way that you could organize the data um, in order to perform a chi-square analysis uh, to, to really um, kind of zone into the statistical significance of the tweets. Yes, know, the we try. Uh, in English, it's uh, very easy to do. Uh, in my language, unfortunately, it's a very difficult thing to do. And this, uh, this is um, the subject uh, also of my PhD. Yeah. <laughs> we have a lot language of has uh, many problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting. In sentiment uh, analysis, okay. In sentiment analysis. I'd like to meet with you, you after. Oh, okay. sorry. Uh, you have a question, uh, please. Yes, uh, for, please. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, for uh, Professor Sofia, uh, the hashtags uh, work uh, well uh, with the dynamics of uh, politics, but uh, I think uh, that uh, hashtags uh, are uh, made for, uh, with uh, transformation. The hashtag is transformated uh, from uh, one day to another day. They appear uh, from uh, some uh, from some uh, forms, and they transform uh, into uh, other forms, into maybe a few days or uh, more. Uh, the the tag is uh, is uh, fundamental in uh, in creating the these hashtags, maybe. It's uh, uh, semiotics of time also. Uh, thank you. Uh, are you referring to the troll uh, accounts, to the fake accounts? In which account uh, on Twitter do you refer to? Uh, to do your uh, conclusion about hashtags. Uh, you said that the uh, uh, play a good role in, uh, in the dynamics of politics. So uh, if we mention the Gaza attack in uh, Palestine, there is a lot of hashtags. They, uh, they work so uh, quick in uh, a few, few days. I, uh, my question is, uh, 
if hashtags um, work uh, also in the long term uh, in uh, changing politics. Thank you. Uh, I suppose that it can uh, work uh, like, like, like in the long term. I'm trying to uh, to figure it out. Yeah. Maybe I am uh, I, uh, contemplating the, in your uh, topic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you too. Sophia, at another time, I'd love to um, to meet with you because I think, oh, no, I don't think I know that there's a lot of overlap in our approaches. And I know that uh, digital humanities and digital research is really a burgeoning field. So I feel like the more of us that are working on uh, methodology together, the, the better oh. we're going to be. Yeah, it will be my pleasure. Um, I will send you, oh, you have my mail, so email yes. me, please. <laughs> I will. <laughs> that, that sounds <laughs> lovely. Yeah. <laughs> With my pleasure. Okay. And well, you too, I, Mr. Samir. If I can uh, help you in some way, or uh, I cannot uh, understand the question you asked me, um, uh, please write to me and um, uh, email to me. Yes, thank you. I, uh, the question uh, happened at the so fast in my mind, so I uh, can't uh, form Okay, I will put <laughs> I, uh, my, I will put, okay, it's okay. I will put my email here in the chat. So if you like to help you in some way, please don't hesitate to do it. Thank you. I, uh, I am interested in the, the quantum uh, semiotics. So your uh, field of uh, Research is uh, is uh, in, in political more, communication. Yes, it's more uh, more beautiful and. Uh, oh, thank you. And, uh, yes, yes, and real. The quantic world is uh, is imaginary. <laughs> Abstract, <laughs> yeah. but but important. Okay. <laughs> well, um, shall I begin? Do you think? Sophia? Yes, yes, move on. Okay. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance in case my connection cuts out. If it does, um, Sophia, send me a quick email uh, and, and let me know, and I'll try to come back in as soon as I can. Okay. Um, I think it's the construction around our house. It's very frustrating, um, especially given the circumstances that we're in right now, uh, trying to work, work from home all over the world. Um, so... I may need to be made co-host to share my screen. Well, uh, I'm sorry, Gabriella. Yes, I make you co-host. Oh, Gabriella. Well, sorry, because I had some problem with the modem and then I tried with my telephone. So finally it's working. Oh. <laughs> sorry, I'm terrible sorry. So I don't know Not what Not at happened. all. Okay, sorry. No, that was perfect timing because I was going to begin and I hadn't I said a word yet. Begin so. If you want, it's better. Oh, please. I can... please, no, no, please, Gabriella, go ahead. Okay, okay, I will so share my screen. Sorry, really? <laughs> no, no, not at all. You, you can see it now? Yes, we yes. can see it. Okay, maybe it's better this way. Okay. Uh, so, as I said before, my name is Arva Gabriella, a PhD student at Charles University in Prague. This is the title of my uh, presentation, Public Tactics for the Writing of Space and Semiotics of the Frontier. So it can be uh, ideally divided into two parts. Uh, the first part will be like uh, more focused on the question of the uh, political uh, space and political geography in Belfast. And then a second part with like some short, uh, very short observation on the question of uh, the Irish border and the Brexit, after the Brexit in particular. So here you have like um, a very simplified um, sort of schema of the concept of the semisphere coming from the semiotic theory of Lotman. As I said, it's really simplistic. I mean, with the, an ideal center and ideal peripheral areas represented this way, because I think that this model can be applied in my studies to the city of Belfast. Uh, as you can probably see uh, here, you have like the, the city center and then like uh, the so-called uh, working class areas like here, Shankill and Falls. 
policies are mainly predominantly um, Republican and Catholic uh, working class area, while on the other side, Schenkin is a mainly unionist and Protestant uh, working class area. So there is this sort of uh, uh, opposition which uh, can make like Belfast as a sort of a possible uh, semi-sphere. As, as I said, uh, a possible semi-sphere because the question of space is incre incredibly important still nowadays in uh, the geography of Belfast, um, according to Feldman, but also Bolland's like quite recently in 2012, uh, both of them underlined how much uh, Belfast is still uh, divided and segregated cities. So really, um, place and spaces uh, really play an important role by the point of view of the ethic, um, ethical and uh, political like uh, characteristics of the, of the cities. Uh, in particular, the city center is more connected with a sort of in an institutional memory, while on the opposite, the working class areas uh, can be said to be like more uh, community-based, uh, like related to more community-based memories. So this is a very good schema proposed by Thalman in 1991. When you can see a uh, sort of contraposition between the two um, sanctuary areas and in the middle, the interface. The interface is like the place in which the violence during the troubles actually uh, took place. Uh, it's really can be uh, symbolically read as a sort of uh, death space, so space for death. Uh, of course, the situation has changed a little bit nowadays because there is no like uh, the same amount of violence as during the troubles, but still uh, like in a, um, sort of propaganda way, we can still see that this kind of opposition is still valuable nowadays in the present battles. Here, there are some examples of uh, walls and fences in the city. Uh, these are pictures that I have taken personally in 2018, so quite recently in, uh, in Belfast. You can see that they are really uh, like a strong presence in the panorama of the city. And also make a talk of the, um, uh, like analyze the way in which like uh, the number of uh, walls and fences have increased after the Belfast Agreement, so after the, the peace reached in 1998. And they are like quite, um, how can I say, um, well, they can be like read as a symbol of division, of course, because they divide actually like the working um, areas of the city, but at the same time, they can be seen or rethought in a certain ways, new uh, sort of peace lines in a quite uh, contradictory uh, way after the end of the, the conflict. So uh, uh, this, is, uh, this presence of the walls has been challenged by the working, uh, uh, working class areas, above all through like the presence of slogans, uh, murals directly on the walls, uh, graffiti and so on, which are incredibly important because they, these are the places in which you can see really like the sort of self-representation of the um, identity of the, these communities. Here is, for example, a picture which has been taken in a Protestant uh, part of the city of Belfast. And here it comes like my main idea, uh, which is based on this article from uh, Mitchell and Kelly published in 2010 in which it's possible to see the sort of uh, opposition between strategy and tactic on the other side. According to Michel de Certeau, so what we wrote already in the 1980s, like the strat uh, we can imagine like to have a sort of a strategic policy, which in the case of Belfast is mainly um, promoted by the Belfast City Council and also I would add the uh, European Union through certain kind of projects promoted, while on the other side, like tactic comes from the this working class areas. So for example, uh, the kind of murals uh, that they are depicting or also the use of certain flags or symbols, for example, can be read as a sort of a tactic uh, in order to resist the power from the strategic policy from, from the center. Here is an example. Uh, so this one is not, uh, was previously a mural. Now it's only a poster showing uh, an old mural, which was considered to be too offensive uh, for, for the other community. So like the city center decided to replace it. So to force a little bit like the community to replace it with something which is considered not to be so offensive, like a better representation. And this is a really common, I think nowadays, you know, so many plants, um, from the city, from the city centers, uh, really uh, try to promote another image of the of the city of Belfast after the conflict. Here also the example of the bonfires, which are set on fire uh, in the night between the 11th and the 12th of July, when there is a celebration of the Battle of the Boyne, which took place in 1690. 
And also, I think that bonfires can be read as an example of tactic, because also in this case, like the Belfast City Council tried many times really to intervene directly and to at least to ask to the communities to build them in a safer place. It's not so close to the houses because many accidents actually happened in the past, like houses put on fire or this kind of things. Here on the other side, there is an, another example of the strategic use of the space in Belfast, because for example, um, um, this sort of introduction of the new quarters of the city is quite recent. Uh, the most important of these four, the Cathedral, the Titanic, the Galtat, and the Queen's Quarter. And they can see as an example of strategies because they are really trying to promote another image of the city above all for the tourists and not so much for the local people. And they do not uh, anyway um, uh, follow like what was like the original um, map or districts of the, of the city of Belfast. So in a certain way, it's like a, um, a certain uh, sort of an image which is imposed on the, on the, on Belfast. So all what I said until now, that can, can be read as the examples of the space policies, as I said before, uh, in which like we can imagine, as I said before, this Belfast is a semi-sphere in which like walls or uh, other kind of symbols are used uh, from the peripheries in order to challenge you know, what uh, the, the strategies the uh, centers are trying to, to impose on the, on the city. This is another example, just a section of the so famous international wall. Um, here, uh, I was like, try to, to think about the international wall in a new way. As I think that we can imagine it as the sort of place in which the representation of an imaginary geography uh, can be seen. I mean, here Republicans, uh, the Republican community can somehow try to imagine like a utopian, even in certain aspects, uh, uh, future for, uh, for the Republic of Ireland, uh, for, for Ireland, and above all, of course, a united Ireland, which is like the main goal to be the rich in the future. And I think this can be related with certain ideas uh, which are um, come from Graymas, but also Lotman uh, was talking about the, the myth, uh, for example, the St. Patrick's book. So like the kind of mythology which can we can find in the city and around the city as well. So these are mythologies uh, concerning also the future, not just the past, for example. Here there's just a short list, but I think that what is really important is to know that, for example, in the nationalist murals, so we can see that uh, this mythology are mostly set in a sort of more global uh, framework, uh, while on the contrary, loyalist murals uh, tends to be more uh, tend to be set more on a, a sectarian and local level, um, so more trying to challenge like the the identity of the unionist community. And here, here it's important because, um, again, this is another section of the international wall. And I think that this idea that I said was sort of an imaginary geography, um, it's important for future developments of semiotic discourse around, uh, on geography because like uh, Umberto Eco, also Franco Farinelli has tried really to uh, outline how much like geography is not just the description of a place, but it takes with it also, uh, like a basic knowledge, uh, the knowledge which is at the base of our Western society. So of course there is a lot of uh, like cultural uh, perspective on it. So it's not just something uh, objective or by this point of view. So here there is a second section, just some short really observation on the question of the frontier and the Irish border after the Brexit, as I said before. So you can see here uh, the map, I don't know, maybe not entirely, but uh, where there is the region of Ulster and the six uh, so-called six county, uh, this was called the really six county solution because again it was a sort of imposition when there was this split between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. Uh, somehow, like uh, there, there was this sort of creation of this uh, uh, of, of Northern Ireland, which made, of course, both the Republican community and both the, the Protestant community not really happy about uh, about it, because one side the Republicans wanted to have like a unified Ireland. On the other side, it seemed that this question of the new Irish border was making also like unionist uh, communities really unhappy about it. So this question of the border became even more complicated, I think, uh, when like the community, the com uh, European community became a, an important like actor also in the uh, geographical uh, politics of the 80s above all. Um, in this this book, for example, for Kearney, 
already in 1988, uh, uh, it's extremely important to think about the new frontiers and nationalist border inside the new reality of the European Union. So here is an example just to, to see the difference between what was before the hard border and what became after the soft border. So you could have like before checks, uh, the physical and actual presence of the border, while nowadays you can like cross uh, in a totally free way and so there is no difference at all. I mean, you cannot see any, any border, even if actually it exists somehow, some kind of border, because of course we are always talking about two different countries. So after the Brexit, uh, th there was again, uh, like uh, this question of the border. You can see here, for example, a Republican slogan with no hard border, no soft border, no border at all. Uh, because of course, like after Brexit, there was a, again this problem, and the Republican community uh, is strongly against um, the possibility of a new hard border. Because of course, they think this can be a sort of betrayal to what was like uh, the basis of the Belfast uh, Agreements in 1988. While on the other side, this question is making also like uh, the Unionist community unhappy because they say, okay, if there, there, will, there is not going to be a new border, so what is the, the role of Northern Ireland? I mean, we will be a sort of a uh, particular state inside uh, the reality of Great Britain after the Brexit. That's a sort of a new Irish question somehow. Uh, here again, like uh, the, the importance, you no, know, uh, the Irish government's case was that Brexit, Brexit challenged the basis of the peace process by raising the possibility that the frontier could again become a customs, regulatory, and security border, a site of armed attacks, and an indication that the Good Friday Agreement had been reversed. Let's say before. So I think that in the future, like some interesting uh, observation can be done uh, about the question of the visibility and the invisibility of the border. Uh, because as I said before, it seems that uh, even if there is actually still nowadays a border, if it is not feasible, somehow it's like uh, the, the border does not exist. So, so th this seems not to be, uh, which is quite interesting because uh, uh, this takes with it also like this very strange, uh, from, my point, from my point of view, like a proposal of an invisible high-tech land border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland with customs check conducted at business premises some distance away from frontier. So it's seeming that, okay, we can like solve this kind of problem uh, by uh, through the construction of a sort of an invisible border. Here came the idea, which is like the, the temporary solution at the moment, as probably everybody know, uh, which is the one of the Irish Sea border which is also making above all the unionist, of course, community absolutely unhappy about it, because again, uh, Northern Ireland seems to be treated in a totally different way compared to the other countries of Great Britain. So here for some uh, possible future scenarios, uh, here you can say like a uh, unionist murals and poster against this, uh, this idea of the Irish uh, sea border. Uh, as I said, it seems unhappy, it seems unlikely like uh, at the present that uh, a unified uh, Ireland can be reached in the short terms, so maybe maybe later in the future. But what is what can be really interesting in the future and even now is to reflect again on the question of identity above all for the uh, Protestant communities, as it seems that most of the Protestant community was uh, against uh, Brexit, so they wanted actually to stay in, in Europe. So I think that this can be like an important topic in the future and can uh, again like, um, again, challenge, uh, I mean, what was the, the sense of Britishness of the uh, century of the moon? And that's, that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabriela. That was, that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions for Gabriela? Gabriela, can I ask you one question? Sure. Um, have you have you connected at all? Like, I, there are so many semioticians that certainly have addressed the question of memory, um, and 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 place, um, and place and time, especially in phenomenology. Um, but in sociology, there are some thinkers such as Benedict Anderson who who talk about imagined communities. Has has he played factored? 
at all in, uh, in your perspective on the imaginary, imagining borders, imagining identity? Um, well, well, I don't know. I mean, I'm working on it now. Uh, so yeah, of course I know like the, this book from uh, Benedict Anderson about the imaginative communities. Um, I, I was actually trying to avoid a little bit always this insistence on the question of identity. I know that of course it's extremely important because memory and identity are so strictly interconnected that it's almost impossible. But I would like also maybe to challenge these ideas and also to, to see how, um, I mean, now that the turn you know, in the memory studies is um, towards a sort of a global perspective more than local perspective. Mm. There are the presence of like new memories uh, coming from immigrants and so on. So probably mm -hmm. I would like maybe to be more focused on the emergence of new global scenarios and not just the local identities as it was like mainly the focus in the previous memory studies. That makes sense, yeah. So evaluating how, I don't wanna say new identities because then we're still into identity politics, but um, the formation of, of belonging, how that is semiotically uh, constructed, is that what you're thinking? Yeah, exactly. Something like this, exactly. Okay. I, yeah, I like that direction a lot. <laughs> Anyone yeah, else? Yes, yeah. I have a question. Here. Again, uh, Gabriela, Professor Gabriela, you talked about invisible uh, border. Uh, this invisible border are uh, signifiers or uh, signified of the, the sculptor uh, science? Oh, uh, well. Can you repeat it, please? The, the invisible borders. Hmm? We, we can uh, uh, conceive them as uh, signifiers or uh, signified to the uh, culture of science. Do well, I, I, think, I think both, because like, you cannot see like a material you know, or actual border. So this is like the absence, we can say, was sort of a concrete or actual signifier. And on the other side, like the meaning would be there is no border. So, so on the point of view, it's signified. So I think that the, this question involves both of signified and unsignified. I think, I think Peirce's conception of tri triadicity is really relevant too, because if you think about the interpretant, oftentimes, I mean, well, Peirce had many conceptions of what the interpretant was and, and the, the function it served within uh, the triadic semiotic model, but it seems to me that one of those functions is very abstract, it's, it's mental. So there's like a mental signifier in people's imaginary, right? That, that carries a lot of weight in terms of um, signifying what it means to belong. And I think that's, that's, that's what you're trying to crack, Gabriela. Sure, 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 absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, any, anyone else have any questions before we move on? I would have a question, please, if possible. Mm -hmm. I'm Horia uh, Kiriak, um, and I, um, I want to, to ask about the possibility of uh, finding a common interpretant of the border for the two parts. Uh, because uh, it seems to me that uh, 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 that border uh, signifies something different, uh, depending how we look at it, uh, culturally speaking. Because a border is uh, about uh, um, about the relation uh, of uh, of a state with uh, with external entities and this relation is conceived uh, dramatically different in terms of uh, values uh, in in that area uh, uh, how could we exploit uh, semiotically this situation thank you thank you <laughs> well i think it's really complicated question i mean uh... <laughs> Like again, again, the Irish question. I mean, at the moment, I cannot see personally any any solution also by this semiotic point of view, because if we avoid the border, we are uh, going to make the unionist uh, community unhappy, and if we are trying to build another border, we are going to make the Republican community unhappy. 
So I think it's really it's a big problem to, to deal with. So absolutely, I don't know absolutely in this moment what, what kind of solution can and can be reached in, in the next future and in the near future. Thank you, thank you. So do we have, is Roxana with us by any chance? Has, has Roxana joined us? I don't think she has. Oh, that's a shame. Okay, um, does everybody mind if, if uh, I move forward with my presentation? No, Please good. Proceed. Okay, okay. <laughs> wonderful. Um, I was gonna make sure that I can share my screen. Oh, let's start at the beginning, not at the end. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, I, I guess I'll begin by uh, introducing myself. My name is Sofia Malonson Ricciardoni. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate um, with a joint program of communication and culture at York and Ryerson University. So both universities um, house the program. Um, the title of, of my uh, talk is, I, I was trying to be playful in omnia operatus because in omnia operatus, as some of you may know in Latin means ready for anything. But when we're talking about um, the digital sphere, I, I, I thought um, ready for any operation is probably more appropriate to the topic that I'm, I'm looking at. So I'm looking at semiotic translations in digitally mediated uh, political communication. Um, so in 2018, just to give us some context, a case study here, the clandestine uh, political consultation agency, uh, SCL groups, which is a subsidiary of the infamous Cambridge Analytica, claimed that their mission was to create behavior change through research, data analytics, and strategy for both domestic and international governments. Uh, according to researchers, automated evaluations of online behavior can produce a statistically significant assessment of individual personality, excuse me, personality traits. SCL Group and Cambridge Analytica claim that these personality traits may be leveraged to curate content that substantively influences the beliefs and voting behaviors of constituents. And the results of the Brexit referendum in 2016 the US presidential election uh, in 2016, among many other electoral activities around the globe, indicate that their claims may carry some weight. Um, evidently, as we embark upon the third decade of the 21st century, the political imaginary is no longer cultivated between the public sphere and the state through common understanding that makes possible common practices and wi a widely shared sense of legitimacy. The intervention of digital media has generated what Brown and Deal term hybrid politics, which are su sustained by a wavering and destabilized political consciousness severed from the established logic of political institutions. Until recently, studies produced within the sphere of political science and communication studies have focused predominantly on the govern governing infrastructure of civic culture and the role served by political actors. In capturing how interlocutors socially construct the political imaginary, Taylor drew from the conception of the social imaginary, which delineates the ways in which interlocutors can collectively imagine their social existence. Brown and Deal uh, define the political imaginary as a collective structure that organizes the imagination and the symbolism of the political and therefore organizes the, ins the instituting processes of the political as well. Accordingly, any study that aims to understand how the political is defined must account for how a community of people becomes institutionalized into a society and how social and political expectations are normalized, defined, learned, and shared. Given digital media's contributions to the emanation of hybrid politics in recent time, evaluation of how algorithms instantiate the beliefs and values that shape the political imaginary is essential to understanding how institutions are legitimized and delegitimized in contemporary life. 
theoretically informed by Susan Petrilli's translative semiotics as a process by which signs relate to other signs within a web of semiosis that facilitate uh, the translation of meaning, and Peirce's conception of the interpretant as a mediating representation which represents the, the relate, now this is Peirce's language, the relate to be a representation of the same correlate which this mediating representation itself represents. This paper examines how the meaning of political signs are constituted between human agency and algorithmic transactions within the context of digital culture. I will contend that the meaning of political content is shaped by semiotic translations with an, an ecology of mediation online and that the transient and impermanent nature of digital media destabilizes meaning as signs are carried from the domain of human semiosis into the online signifying orders and then back again into human, uh, the human mediated world. So first, I think before we proceed uh, to the intricacies of this argument, uh, we must first examine what a medium is and what it does. In doing so, this paper adopts Posner's framing of media as any means of conveying meaning through a channel that defines the nature of semiosis. In this sense, any system of representation is a medium, which includes schemas of visual representation, uh, built and virtual environments, bodily schemas, biological functions, chemical relations of reactivity, uh, and in our case, institutional orders, could all be conceiv conceivably considered mediums. Um, and here I've, I've offered uh, three spheres um, of mediation that have been identified by Posner. It's not an exhaustive list, but it's the three that relate to my argument. So uh, he defines technological media as uh, something that mediates the production and reception of uh, sign processes. Social media uh, are the social institutions that organize biological, physical, and technological means of sign production. And biological media is the sense modalities of an organism through which signs are produced and received. Uh, in my work, I'm framing biological media, excuse me, I'm framing uh, human cognition as a, a form of biological media because I'm really concerned with how the mind um, works with or makes sense of um, signifying matter. Um, according to such framing, state politics, human cognition, and digital technology may be conceived as three distinct signifying spheres, as media, that translate meaning carried by sign vehicles according to the nature or code of each sign system. Ostensibly, collaborative translations between human cognition, state politics, and digital media in contemporary life results in what we now live with, in terms of fake news, alternative, alternate facts, uh, which begs further examination. So let us first examine the algorithm as technological media. Um, unlike the expert systems model that computers operated by in the 1980s and 1990s, which could only perform narrow and specialized tasks, the deep learning neural networks of contemporary algorithms are designed to perform an emaciated simulation of human cognition. Digitally animated algorithms are programmed to respond and adapt to emergent configurations of data online in real time by detecting statistically significant patterns in human generated data activity. Before being launched into cyberspace, the artificial neural networks of machine learning algorithms are first exposed to a manually curated data set as a means of training the algorithm how to detect, detect patterns in data and to calculate the statistical significance of those detected patterns. These patterns are then committed to a virtual memory uh, within several hidden layers between what is termed the input layer. So the input layer is um, the values that are inputted um, by humans as they interact with the interface online, uh, and the output layer, uh, which is essentially the, the conclusion that the algorithm reaches in order to produce um, something that happens online according to the input. Um, and this, is crea this creates what is termed a neural network or a simulated neural network. Each layer contains a series of nodes that supply values to the neural network, con uh, contributing to a statistically derived interpretation 
or prediction about what the input value means. Um, nodes belonging to the input layer are passive. They have to be because it's just raw data uh, in that they merely convey the content of input, uh, the human generated data to the artificial neural network. The nodes belonging to the hidden layers and the output layers are active in that they modify the values of the data delivered by the input layer through what is termed uh, backward propagation. So what I have on the screen right now is um, a GIF, an animated GIF of what that might look like. So essentially, um, if the outcome doesn't reach an anticipated threshold uh, of result, the value is fed back into the neural network, into the hidden layers for reevaluation until it gets as close as possible, statistically speaking, to the result that um, is sought. So the, after, after the algorithm has gone through a training set, it's really interesting because then it can um, somewhat function on its own. It's, it's called uh, semi-autonomous. Um, once the algor algorithm is trained, it is no longer dependent upon the agency of the programmer and is able to generate its own statistically determined rules for data processing, which evolve within the activity generated between nodes belonging to the hidden layers of the artificial neural network. Uh, and, then, and then upon the, the launch of the algorithm, it becomes semi-autonomous, as I just said. Um, and it often behaves in ways that are unanticipated by the engineers and programmers who created it. It's alive, essentially, not in the animate sense that a human is alive, but it's alive in that it's, um, it's responding to us in real time. Um, so for example, an autonomous car whose self-driving algorithm was developed by NVIDIA did not conform to the instructions programmed by its developers, but rather the algorithm used its artificial neural network to teach itself how to drive a car by observing <laughs> a human driving behavior. And of course, when we say observing, it's, it's basically just converting human behaviors into values that are then inputted into the neural network. And I put this, this slide up because this doesn't even capture how sophisticated these neural networks can be. And this is of course a, a representation, a symbolic representation of what a neural network does. Um, but you would have to multiply this activity by thousands and thousands in order to really capture how sophisticated these systems are. Not as sophisticated as the human neural network by far, um, but still pretty sophisticated in terms of um, a piece of technology. Um, so using the Facebook application, ooh, excuse me, let me just make sure I'm not skipping. Um, Yes, okay, so using Facebook application, my personality, two University uh, of Cambridge researchers, Mikhail Kudzinski and David Stilwell, uh, recruited 86,220 volunteers uh, who completed a 100 item international personality item pool uh, based on the five factor model of personality, which is it's a questionnaire that's been around in psychology for quite some time typically used um, by mental health clinicians to measure and evaluate traits of openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, and neuroticism. Uh, correlated, they correlated participants' scores with judgments made by other humans and computer models. And using a linear regressor model, they, predicted, they, they claimed to predict, be able to predict 13 life outcomes and traits related to personality. Uh, the researchers were able to evaluate participants' life satisfaction, whether they suffered from depression, what their political orientation is, uh, the degree of impulsivity, their values, interests, uh, field of study, whether they were substance dependent, the state of their physical health based on their activity on Facebook. This, this is not an exhaustive list either. Uh, the study's findings assert that computer predictions calculated by trained algorithms of personality traits uh, are more accurate than those made by fellow human interlocutors. Now, um, I'm, I'm stating the result of this study, but by no means am I um, um, a protagonist of, of, of this, these results. I question the results, um, but I can certainly provide you with the article if you're interested in looking at them yourselves. I'm still um, examining the, 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 the methodology behind the study. 
Uh, as expected, this model for automated personality mining has since been leveraged by various political actors to psychometrically target specific personality traits affiliated with various constituencies to glean information that could be politically instrumentalized. Psychometrics being a computational process used to harness the power of methodologies from the social and compu computational sciences in understanding and predicting human behavior in offline and online environments. In 2014, data scientist Alexander Kogan, along with others uh, connected with the University of Cambridge, initiated the inception of Global Science Research, a, a, a data tech company based in the UK. The company developed a Facebook app called This Is Your Digital Life to harvest the, pers the, the personal information of roughly, roughly 50 million people, which was bequeathed to a political, political consultation agency, you probably have already guessed, Cambridge Analytica, whose services have been commissioned by politici politicians belonging to the Republican Party in the US since 2012. The consultation agency also claims that it played a decisive role in the 2016 election of Donald Trump and indirectly in the Brexit referendum through its sibling agency here in Canada, Aggregate IQ. So what is going on here? I think that this is what we really need to, um, to examine. So certainly, the psychometric measurement of constituents' personality during electoral campaigns using deep learning neural network algorithms presents clear implications for political communication ethics that definitely warrant further investigation. However, it could be argued that inquiry into the ways in which algorithmically curated assemblages of signs shape the political imaginary generates a much bolder, I argue, argument uh, or contribution, excuse me, to our understanding of how digital processes facilitate the ability to undermine democrat democratic governance in contemporary life. Furthermore, given that deep learning neural networks of psychometric algorithms are trained to analyze and adapt to indexes of human behavior um, online, it is equally productive to account for how the human mind makes sense of digitally assembled networks uh, of politically salient signs which ultimately determines how meaning is constituted within the political imaginary. Put more succinctly, excuse me, understanding the contributions of digital culture in shaping the political imaginary in contemporary life importunes an account of both human semiosis and machine semiosis and the resulting collaborative synthesis of sign relations established between human agency and algorithmic functions. The assemblage of a network of signs generated between humans and machines has been termed sem cyber semios, excuse me, cyber symbiosis by Margellis and Sagan, and cyber semiosis by Sibiak. Deleuze and Guattari uh, further define the technological mediation of knowledge, uh, an assemblage of enunciation uh, within the mach machinic assemblage. And I'm, I'm going to be expanding upon Deleuze and Guattari in uh, other papers, um, but I find it's very useful just to mention that because it really gives us a sense of, you know, they're not alive, they're not sentient beings, these algorithms, but yet they are able to propagate ways of enunciating genres, expressions, uh, and sentiments. Uh, so within the domain of human communication, Susan Petrilli identifies two different but interrelated modes of semiosis, including semiosis for modeling, which involves the formation of sign networks as interlocutors socially construct a culturally shared reality, or umwelt, uh, as one of school would have termed it, and invent culturally relevant artifacts, including computers, robots, and algorithms. And semiosis of communication, uh, which encompasses the norms, codes, genres, custom schemas, and modalities established by signifying logic of socially constructed realities, uh, including related artifacts. Uh, what is important to note here before progressing any further is with this discussion is that human, the human predilection for creativity and invention precludes semiosis for modeling, which engenders the invention of machine semiosis the latter could not exist without the existence of the former. Similar, similarly, modern democracies are the consequence of human semiosis for modeling, which accounts for the construction of various institutional orders invented to govern 
uh, society en masse. Politics are the assemblages of enunciation, as Deleuze and Guattari would put it, that result in the civic semiosis of communication, contoured by the social sociocultural relationships that form within the sign networks established across various institutional orders, both domestically and now more and more so uh, internationally. Semiosis of communication as defined um, by the signifying logic of any given sign network can be conceived of as a form of mediation through which the potentiality of meaning is realized as signs become oriented within a contextualizing network of other representations or within a web of signs, as Sibiak would have put it. Um, mediation as conceived by Roland Posner is distinguished from the more idiomatic framing of media as mass communication and that he defines media as a system of network or signs um, that constrain sign behaviors and expressions by imposing a signifying logic onto the relationship between signs. A medium in this sense can be any system or means of production, um, distribution and reception of signs, which become scaffolded to the life of signs in the minds of the users. And that's a quote from Newt. Um, in shaping the social and political imaginaries, media prescribe the conventional schematics for shared communication practices, which promotes interpersonal alignment among social interlocutors. Put more simply, a medium creates a sort of rule book for how representation should function within a, a network of signs and how each sign within this network representationally relates to other signs, which informs interpersonal conventions, customs, and behaviors. Uh, in the context of digital media, a deep learning neural network al algorithm functions as a medium that constrains sign relations according to the logic of a statistical computation which assembles online representations based on predictive interpretations of online activity. With respect to the psychometric algorithm developed by researchers at the University of Cambridge, statistical computations create predictive interpretations, symbolic signs, about the traces of human behaviors online, indexical signs, um, that are assigned to an individual personality trait. And I, I call them iconic signs only because I, I really want to draw attention to the fact that there is st we still have our own personality traits that are outside of this neural network online. And more and more so the, the, the line blurring between the online um, more indexical or symbolic representation of our, tra our personality traits are not necessarily related to what our personality traits are actually are because as personalities as people who have personalities we're constantly evolving right so there are two different entities altogether through uh, technically three because you have the symbolic um the symbolic domain the iconic domain and the um indexical domain so the code symbolically represents predictive interpretations about individual personality traits that then prompts the aggregation of value into a composite codified representation of an individual's personality alongside other sh others sharing the same interpretive values. And I say I want to stress values because they are not necessarily, they're, they're not um, iconic of, of people's in actual personality traits. They're just an interpretation. Um, Deleuze and Guattari frame this process as double articulation through which distinction between expression and content, uh, units of expression and units of content, for example, signs and particles are stripped of their originating qualia and reconstituted according to the schematics of another system of semiosis. In other words, an individual's actual personality trait is stripped of its originating territory within the individual as it is expressed within an online communication event. The index of this personality trait as represented by code, is then deterioratorialized from its origin and transformed into an expression that fits within the logic of digital algorithms. The originating embodied expression of personality trait online then becomes a symbolic representation within algorithmic code, which is deterioratorialized within the signed system of statistical representation. The yielding results derived from the code symbiotic, symbolic, sorry, symbolic, Sym symbolically, my goodness, I can't read my own writing, symbolically representing an individual personality trait is con constituted within a composite string 
of other coded values, resulting in an output that activates the automated curation and assembly of representational online content, which Baudrillard would call simulacra content, that determine, is determined according to the algorithmic interpretation of an individual's personality, personality categor, categorization, or what John Cheney Lippold terms measurable type. The resulting assemblage of signifying simulacra is broadcast back to the individual from the originating index, uh, originating index of behavior, which was harvested as the individual participated in various communication events online. For a semiotician, this is where inquiry becomes very interesting. Though the efficacy of an algorithm's ability to accurately assess an individual's personality based on indexes of their behaviors remains precarious, the reality that representational matter is assembled by algorithms whose activities remain outside of the individual's direct influence means that our representational online environments are constructed and individualized according to the goals defined by the architects and engineers of algorithms that assemble our virtual spaces. How the human mind manages and the information carried into it through the mediating affordances of algorithm, algorithmically assembled composites determines the ways in which meaning is mentally formed, thus affecting our mental, embodied, and emotional states. Given that as a social and intersubjective species, humans are highly sensitive to the mimetic schemas of fellow social interlocutor, interlocutors, and that a common way of speaking tends to converge among social interlocutors as they engage with one another, and that studies have established strong evidence of linguistic alignment within human computer interactions, it is not inconceivable to surmise that the semiospheres co-constructed between humans and algorithms are deeply implicated in shaping the norms, values, customs, codes, and belief systems that we live by, including those that inform uh, our collectively constituted political imaginaries. Peirce's recognition um, uh, that the sign is only made intelligible in relation with other signs may be instrumental to illustrating how digital technology contributes to the assembly of our contemporary semiosphere, and by extension, the political imaginary. As defined by Peirce, an interpretant is a mental effect of thought that is stimulated by a representament, which is the character of a thing by virtue of which for the production of a certain mental effect, it may stand in place for something else. The mental effect denoted here may include the inducement of mental composites that of related representations or related signs to manifest within the mind, which produces a web of psychic semiosis that elicits the emergence of particular interpretations. From the perspective of Gestalt theory, the mind integrates signs perceived in its surroundings with related knowledge already stored in memory to conceptually assemble a holistic interpretation. In other words, the mind evaluates composites of signs as a gestalt rather than uh, un as unrelated and unconnected component parts. The human mind perceives representations in the world as meaningfully organized wholes, and it makes sense of those wholes by creating relations between its component parts. Provided that in the digital era, a good deal of the representations taken into the mind, the representamons, are assembled by digital algorithms, and in view of the fact that the human mind is compelled to align with others through human computer interactions, it can be argued that digital culture makes intimate contributions to the assemblage of our political imaginary resulting in unstable, an unstable state of hybrid politics, post-truths, alternative facts, and fake news that bestow the real consequences to our political realities. The question remains as to whether our democratic institutions can sustain the convolutions propagated by these conditions. So I want to make um, um, a special thank you to my wonderful supervisors, Dr. Jamin Pelkey and Dr. Stephanie Walsh Matthews here in Canada, as well as to my longstanding mentors, um, my master's supervisor, uh, Dr. Marcel Denisi at the University of Toronto, and uh, my Zia Susie, Dr. Susan Petrilli at the University of Bari. Thank you. Congratulations uh, for your uh, presentation, a uh, really insightful one. Oh, Can thank I put you a question, please? Of course. Really inspiring your, uh, um, your presentation. Um, 
whilst I was uh, uh, listening you, I was thinking about uh, uh, Wittgenstein. Mm. Um, about um, one of uh, his uh, uh, memorable sentences in his uh, Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. The world is not the totality of objects. It is the totality of the uh, um, um, how I can know, I, I, I know where you're going with this. Yes, the, the totality of the state of the facts. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we have here a deep crisis, uh, crisis about uh, indexical signs because at the basis of the indexical signs we have causality mm -hmm. but these kinds of uh, indexical signs uh, uh, are used or are influenced by the machine let's say by the uh, by the computers uh, in such a way that uh, the common people are confronted with a distorted umwelt Mm -hmm. So uh, my question is, uh, what about uh, what about the semiotic analysis of the responsibility of those who created such a machine? Because yes. in terms of causality, the authors of this algorithm that is able to distort political reality and to manipulate the political imaginary for large uh, groups of people uh, is a sign actually mm -hmm. is a, a sign of decadence of moral decadence what is your opinion about that hmm. uh, one, that's one moment please yes. sorry we have to finish in uh, five minutes so <laughs> be quick <laughs> And if you have a question, please uh, leave your email address to to correspond. Thank you. Okay, okay. if um, um, if you could uh, uh, give us also your email, it would be great. To, I will to continue yeah. our discussion. I will give you mine here. Okay, I'm just. Uh, how do I stop sharing? I'm trying to get back to the chat feature so that I can put it into, oh, here we are. Okay, stop share. And that'll allow me to go into the chat. Um, but while I'm doing this, I'll, I'll answer your question a, a little bit. Um, it's a loaded question and I have lots of feelings about it. I have lots of thoughts about it. <laughs> um, I, I think th this is, it's a, it, the reason why I wanted to do this PhD in the first place was exactly to answer that question. I do feel that um, there is some responsibility. I, I love the reason why I love Susan Petrilli's work. I've been I've been mentored by her since I was uh, in my early twenties um, because she she's such an insightful woman in terms of looking at the ethics of contemporary life through a semio, she calls it semioethics. She and Ponzio um, have written a book and I, the, the title eludes me right now, um, but it's specifically on semioethics and there's a chapter dedicated to machine semiotics. Um, and I would love, I, I'm conducting a study very similar to Sophia Massini's uh, work. I have gathered um, six, roughly 68,000 tweets, if you believe it around uh, a political issue because I want to illustrate that the work that bots do, Twitter bots um, do online is significant uh, in terms of shaping the political imaginary uh, societally. And um, there are serious, serious political implications. And we must, you're right, we must remember that these machines, these algorithms are not magical beings. They're not pixies that are coming out of the walls to change our minds. Um, there are people behind those algorithms. Um, and it is true that once an algorithm is launched, it's hard to predict what it's going to um, 
produce, but during the training process, so that, that process that I was describing where the, the data set is, uh, or excuse me, the algorithm is trained on a data set before it's launched into cyberspace, there's a lot of control right there at that, at that point. So I think if I were to target from a semiotic point of view to target the implications of what we're describing here, um, I would be looking at that process, that, that domain of the process in creating an algorithm. And hopefully we can tackle that with good policy. Okay, thank you. And uh, also congratulations uh, to Ms. Sophia. Very, very good uh, presentation. I can hardly wait to, to talk uh, to you later on. Thank you very much. And I, mean, I have I can't a wait. small uh, comment uh, where uh, semiotics and uh, algorithms can uh, meet. Uh, uh, the theory of Yuri Lotman, the semiosphere, is just a case of uh, semiotics with uh, algorithms in social media. Mm -hmm. Because of the network that is, uh, uh, that, is uh, that appears. I agree. And I think uh, Gabriella said about semiosphere before. Yeah. Yeah. Yuri Lotman's theory is for semiotics. And yes, also, yes, yes, you're right. You're right. Yeah. I missed, I missed Lotman. I, I, you're right. Thank you for, for bringing Lotman up, Sophia. I have uh, observations. Uh, uh, the machine uh, uh, algorithms uh, have uh, deals with uh, codes, uh, communicative codes. Uh, this uh, communicative codes have uh, an indictical behavior. The, the sign in these uh, curves are uh, like indexes. Uh, mm. Yes, they are. This is the free communication. Uh, thank I you. agree. Yep, absolutely. Oh, we yeah. have to say goodbye to everyone. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry to to everyone. Bye. Yes, everyone. thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you for attending. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. 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 Nice to meet everyone. Me too. Nice to meet you. <laughs>